The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The next day, when the people who remained after the feeding of the 5,000 saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that when we see it, we might believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. But it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Gracious God, I speak in your name and in your presence, asking that my words would be pleasing to you, guided by your Spirit, and that the hearts and minds of your people would be open to you. Through Christ our Lord, I pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning we have the second of five installments on the Bread of Life discourse in the Gospel of John. You may remember we began last week with the multiplication of the loaves and fishes followed by Jesus walking on the water. And then we enter into the, the discourse itself and that will carry on through something like 70 some odd verses in the Gospel of John. It's a long discourse, which is characteristic of John's Gospel. I remind you that last week when we looked at the loaves and fishes, I pointed out that Jesus did the Eucharistic action. He, or we should say he did the action that then became the, the movement of the Eucharistic liturgy. He took, he blessed, he broke, he gave. And that then becomes really the theme of this discourse. And when Jesus was walking on the water, when the disciples were, were rowing across and struggling because a strong wind had come and aroused the sea, and they meet Jesus walking on the water, and, or they see Jesus walking on the water, and they are terrified. John's Gospel tells us, and Jesus says to them, I am, fear not. And that I am then becomes really the leitmotif of John's gospel, that Jesus would claim 
the name, the divine name that God gave to Moses when he was on the mountain and God was calling Moses to lead the people out of Egypt and Moses said, who will I tell them is sending me? And God said, I am, or I am that I am. Don't you love that? Is, is, uh, tell them that's who I am. That Jesus claims that name for himself and as he declares that to say fear not in the midst of what's a potentially a death dealing circumstance. Now something else I want to say about the Gospel of John. Most scholars believe that Mark's Gospel was written first. The vast majority of scholars think that today. And that Matthew and Luke followed Mark. And so those three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels, which means they see together. Together seeing, synoptic. John's Gospel is altogether different. It seems to follow a different pattern, and it's, it's constructed in a different way tells many similar stories, but often makes a different point from those stories. And that is especially true in this bread of life discourse and the multiplication of the loaves and fishes and the crossing of the sea. But it takes a little bit of an observant reader to see that. It's not necessarily obvious. Focusing especially on Mark, the miracles of Jesus are the inbreaking of God's power and particularly God's benevolence to make well and to undo the work of Satan in the world. It really is, from the Judeo-Christian point of view, or I should say really the Jewish point of view, it is this inbreaking of God's kingdom. Where Jesus is, the kingdom of God is present. And today, we, I, I like to think of that more as presence than the language of kingdom. That was first century language. Where Jesus is, the presence of God is more available. It's like he opens us to this presence. And that really becomes the emphasis on the miracles of Jesus. John's gospel wants to take us further than that. Now, it's not that John's gospel would deny that. It's more that, that John wants faith to mature beyond that. Now, bear with me a moment. For those of us that might be aware of developmental psychology, it's kind of like that. It's another stage of faith development. And John's gospel was written quite a bit later than Mark, as at least we think it was. And, and lots of the, of, of the first century Christians are now, are now probably deceased when John is writing. And they're coming to terms with the loss of the first generation of Christians and most probably of the apostles. And it's quite possible that even the Gospel of John was written by someone that the disciple John taught rather than John himself. And, but even really maybe profounder than that, John wants the miracles to not be about themselves. John wants the miracles to be about the one who gives miracles. John wants the miracles to be signs that get our attention and take us beyond the sign itself to the one who is I am. The one who is the bread of life. I am the bread of life. The one who is, I am the light of the world. The one who is, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who is, I am. Now here's the thing. We think we want that until it starts to happen to us. Because it's an invitation to let go of our over-attachment on our life in this world. It's an invitation to let go of Jesus provide bread for us. Jesus heal us. Jesus make my life turn out the way I want it to. 
Do you all pray that way? Yeah. Yeah, me too, by the way. I, I, I pray all those prayers. And there's a whole other dimension that John's gospel focuses on and wants to open us to. And, and again, it invites us to let go of our over-attachment on the things that make us feel safe and secure and meaningful and important and significant. And that is exactly what's happening in this text. Now let's, let's look at it together. So af the next day, that's after the feeding of the 5,000, they saw, the crowd saw, that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there on the, on the shore where they had been before. They had, they had gone over to the other side. And so the crowd gets in a boat to go find Jesus. Now, it says that they, they went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. Literally, that says seeking Jesus. And that word seeking is a very pregnant word in the Gospel of John. You may remember I preached that before. It's what, what Jesus says to Mary in the tomb when, when, when Mary is there and, G, and Jesus is gone, you know, at the resurrection. And, and Mary presumes it's a gardener she's talking to and Jesus says, what, whom are you seeking? In the, in the first chapter of John's Gospel, John the Baptist sees Jesus passing by and he says, there goes the Lamb of God. And two of, two of the disciples of John the Baptist start following Jesus because they hear what John said. And Jesus turns and looks at them, and these are the very first words in the Gospel of John uh, that Jesus speaks in the Gospel of John. I'm sorry, Jesus' first words. He turns and looks at them and says, what are you seeking? And that becomes a pregnant question in the Gospel of John. So they're saying that they're seeking Jesus. And then they cross over to the other side. By the way, think about that a moment. It's a large crowd. There were 5,000 that were fed. And they find all these little boats and cross over. That's a lot of seeking, isn't it? That's commendable, isn't it? Wouldn't you say? I, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. So then they found him on the other side of the sea. And they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Now, this is so classic in the Gospel of John. They ask a question. Jesus goes to a whole other level. He, he doesn't really answer that question. He goes to another place in them. Watch this. Jesus answered them, Very truly, or truly, truly, I tell you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, we're coming here, Jesus, because we saw you multiply the loaves and the fishes. We saw the sign you performed. And we, we've been hanging out in the countryside now. We've crossed over the lake to come find you. We're here because we saw you as a miracle worker. Jesus is saying, now, now, now the, wait, hang, just a minute. Let me back up a moment. So, they have come to Jesus. Jesus has received them. He's taken them. And he's blessed them with the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes and his teaching. Now they're coming further. Now Jesus wants to break them. Break loose their notions of who Messiah is, what Jesus is about, and what they're seeking. They're seeking this Messiah. Remember, after he fed them, they, they, they wanted to force him to become king. They, they wanted this king that would come and, and just feed them and solve all their problems and make, make life perfect for them, right? To be this political, social Messiah that would make everything well. Remember, Jesus fled when they came to him for that. So they found him. They've been seeking for him. They found him. They want, dude, give us more bread. Right? You're, you're the dude that, you, you, you know, multiply it for us again. And Jesus knows that's not the plan. Jesus wants them to move, to let their faith move into 
Knowing him as the one who gives eternal life. And that means they got to let go of their over-attachment to, to wanting the life they live to go well. Now, by the way, I, notice I constantly say over-attachment. By the way, that's, that's me being kind. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, we demand it. We're obsessed with it. We're compulsed by it. We're possessed by it. We're addicted to it. And it stops us. And the breaking loose of that is the journey of a lifetime. And it's the ongoing movement into eternal life. I, how's he say that? I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, sir, give us this bread. <laughs> as, the, as the discourse matures, Jesus will say, the bread that I give is the bread of eternal life. As the discourse matures, he will say, I am the living bread. And as John's gospel matures, all these stories end with the story of Lazarus. And Mary and Martha are deeply saddened that Jesus didn't come earlier and heal their brother Lazarus. You all know that story? And Jesus said, do you not believe I am the resurrection and the life? Do you believe this? And Mary's answer is pregnant. I believe that you are the one who is to come. She doesn't say, I believe you are the giver of eternal life, resurrection life here and now, because she can't get there. And so this begins, this, this bread of life discourse, inviting us to move all the way in to eternal life right here, right now, and for all of us to acknowledge all the ways that we are over-attached and over-committed and, and addicted and possessed by the stuff of our natural lives. It, it, there's great irony in the story as they say to Jesus, okay, then if you're the bread of life, what, what sign do you show us? And, and interestingly, in the Greek text, it's very emphatic. What sign do you yourself show us? What work do you perform? They'd already seen the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, but they're all wrapped up in thinking it's supposed to be a certain way. Unlike me and thee. They have all these expectations of what it's supposed to look like and how it's supposed to be. And because of that, the most obvious thing right in front of them, they can't make their way into it. Interestingly, Jesus answers them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom God has sent. Now, that's translated that way because English doesn't have a, a, a way of saying what it actually says. Um, this is the work of God that you believe into the one God has sent. Now, bear with me a moment. Believe into only John's gospel has that phrase. 36 times the gospel of John says, believe into. 32 of those times it's believe into Jesus. I think I'm right about this. Four, it's believe into God. And it's always the verb. John's gospel never uses the noun for faith or believe. It's always the verb. It's always a progression into. By contrast, that phrase, believe into, it's an unusual Greek phrase, is not used by any of the other Gospels. Now, it's, it's argued, maybe it's used less than a handful of times in the rest of the New Testament. Maybe. I don't want to bore you with the grammar. 
The, the noun for faith and, and believe are used, is used more than the verb in all the rest of the New Testament. John never uses the noun. It's only the verb. And he's the only one that uses this phrase. This is the work of God believe into. And it's a journey that we would continue to believe into this one who is the bread that finally satisfies the hunger, the search of the human heart. That we would keep moving into this one, into eternal life, right here, right now. Now, I'd like you to know that it frustrates the bejeebers out of me. That's another kind way of saying it. When Jesus says, whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes into me will never be thirsty. I've been following Jesus for 45 years, and I want to say, really, Jesus? I feel hungry and thirsty all the time. Don't you? And you know what? It's always an invitation to examine my life. And ask myself, how do I keep growing in faith and believing into Jesus? What is it I need to let go of? And what is it I need to be willing to suffer, to be broken, that I can move into eternal life right here, right now? You know, if we just take a pause, I, I did this last week. I, I told you all that. My wife told me, life does this for us, Jimmy. If we think about it, we'd, we're going to die. We're going to get sick. All our prayers are not going to be answered. We're going to die of something. And all our circumstances are not going to be okay. All our plans are not going to work out the way we want them to. God is not going to protect us. We are going to suffer. Now, how magnificent to know eternal life in the midst of that. And that is what Jesus offers us. Eternal life in the midst of that reality of the human situation. That's interesting, as this discourse progresses, Jesus gets more intense and his listeners get, they get frustrated with Jesus and some of his disciples even leave him. It's very, very hard. And Jesus will say, my father has to reveal this to you. Jesus will say, all those who come to me come because my father draws them. I don't want to give away the next week's sermons, but that's a powerful, powerful statement. He's saying, you can't know me as the bread of life unless my Father reveals it to you. So, do you want that? You know, it's funny, I read that and I think, does Jesus mean some people the Father draws and some the Father doesn't? I don't think so. I think the Father is drawing us all, all the time. The question is, are we listening? What are we seeking? Are we willing to have our lives, our, our spiritual eyes open that I could see that Jesus is the bread of life? Jesus is the life of the world. Jesus is the living bread. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. That needs to be awakened to me. And as far as I can tell, a whole lot of times. Again and again and again. You've heard me say before, people say, are you born again? I say, which time? What are we seeking? Amen. Amen.